the First Lady of the Republic of Namibia, Madam Monica Gengos, C.D. Glenn, President of and CEO of the U.S. Africa Development Foundation, the High Commissioner to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Oxford, Rebecca Sarinder, esteemed speakers, panelists, distinguished delegates to the Oxford Africa Conference, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Welcome to the 2018 Oxford Africa Conference. Welcome. <laughs> It is truly a delight uh, for me to be welcoming you here today um, and commencing this event that has been a long time in the making. Uh, my name is Njodin Deunyema, not Notkolo Taka, as, uh, as stated there. Okay, there. Um, I'm the president of the Oxford University Africa Society, and I'm a, I am a Namibian uh, student completing a DPhil in law. Um, by way of introduction, the Oxford Africa Conf uh, Conference is organized uh, by the Oxford University Africa Society, uh, and I would just like to share a few remarks on the Oxford University Africa Society that brings you the conference. Um, at, a time, at the time when we commenced our office, our duties as president and the committee, um, we determined that our vision for the society will be based on three pillars. Those of you who are members will recall. Entrenching Africa in Oxford, entering Oxford for Africans through increasing applications and scholarships, scholarship opportunities, experiencing Africa in Oxford through show, social events and speaker events, and engaging Africa in Oxford. It is this fourth pillar that this conference speaks to directly, recognizing that Oxford has a number of African students annually, we see the organization of this conference as an opportunity to engage with Africa, with those from Africa in Oxford and by bringing Africans to Oxford. The Oxford Africa Conference is an opportunity for the society to contribute to the intellectual exchange of Africans in Oxford and for the, for the creation of meaningful networking opportunities amongst Africans. In particular, we are proud to have delegates this year from all the official six regions of the African Union, North Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, West Africa, and the African diaspora. I pause here to appreciate the new partnership that we have created with Turkish Airlines, um, who have assisted in ensuring that we bring many of our delegates from the continent. I know that they won't be able to join us for the entirety of the conference, therefore, I acknowledge their contribution. We also have various other collaborators and sponsors who include the Vice Chancellor, and we'll hear from the Pro Vice Chancellor later, the Rhodes Trust, um, and we'll have our gala dinner at Rhodes House, as well as the Africa Oxford Initiative. We are grateful for their continued support. Coming back to the conference, we pride ourselves in being a wholly student led conference. And to that end, the Africa Society each year entrusts the conference in the hands of three coaches to head the organization and delivery of the conference. And this year, we entrusted it in Emmanuel Taiwo, a Nigerian student pursuing the Masters of Public Policy, not Paulo Ntaka, a South African student pursuing the MSc in African Studies, and Jeffrey Misomali, a Malawian student pursuing the Masters in uh, tropical medicine. This trio was selected at the beginning of November last year to bring together this conference together with a, with a committee that they subsequently selected. They have the responsibility of deciding the theme, the areas of focus, the speakers to invite, and the, the spearheading of our fundraising activities. It is no doubt a short time to bring together a conference of this magnitude and scale and we are delighted that they took on this duty alongside their academic responsibilities. Coming back, this is the eighth year or the eighth edition of the conference, and it is a particularly unique time for the Oxford University Africa Society as 2018 marks the 60th anniversary of the Oxford University Africa Society, and we'll be celebrating that um, on the 2nd of June, 2018, um, at an event hosted at St. At Anthony's College 
and the good news is that you're all invited. Um, with these few remarks, um, I would like to cede the floor to Not Notkolo, um, one of the co-chairs who will introduce officially the 2018 Oxford Africa Conference. First Lady of the Republic of Namibia, Madame Monica Gengos, C.D. Glenn, President and CEO of the U.S. African Development Foundation, former Chief Justice of Ghana, Georgina Wood, Pro High Commissioner to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, His Excellency Steve Kashinyiwa, Linda Mabena Olagunju, CEO of DLO Energy, esteemed speakers and panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome. My name is Nokolo Ndaga, and I'm the co-chair for the 2018 Oxford Africa Conference. On behalf of the organizing committee, we are delighted to host you for the next two days as we engage in much needed conversations pertaining to the African continent, and of course, to also move beyond the rhetoric. In its eighth year running, the Oxford Africa Conference is a solely student-led initiative that annually convenes over 200 delegates and 50 speakers from the African continent and the diaspora. It is one of the largest and most globally recognized interdisciplinary conferences of its type that attracts academics, policymakers, students, and companies with a vested interest in the continent. The 2018 Oxford Africa Conference takes the theme of enough rhetoric catalyzing an era of concrete action. The theme speaks to the conference committee's desire for a solution-driven conference during which delegates will consider the current challenges and opportunities that are facing the African continent. In the spirit of concrete action, this year the committee has worked hard on producing beyond the rhetoric sessions with our impressive facilitators. Key resolutions that will be passed in these sessions will be collated and passed on to key decision makers in African institutions, including the African Union and regional blocs, mainly SADC, ECOWAS, and the East African community. This conference commenced last week when we had the honor to host, hear from, and engage with His Excellency, President of the Republic of Nigeria, Nana Akufa Addo, who was an African Oxonian himself in the 1960s on 11th May. The the President's keynote address served as a pre-engagement to the Oxford Africa Conference. It was only fitting to have President Akufa Addo set the tone for the conference in light of his own vision for an Africa beyond aid, his flagship policy of a one district, one factory, as well as his implementation of free education for public senior high schools as of 2017. This week, the conversation continues as the substantive conference where we are looking forward to welcoming our speakers from various disciplines and keynote speakers who include incumbent United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina J. Mohammed, founding and managing director of DLO Energy, Linda Mabena Olagunju, former Chief Justice of Ghana, Georgina Wood, and of course, our esteemed speaker today, Madame Monica Gengos, the First Lady of Namibia. I will now welcome the Pro Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Equality at Oxford University, Dr. Rebecca Sarinda, to offer a few remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. As you've just heard, I'm Rebecca Sarenda, Pro Vice Chancellor at the University. And on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, who uh, is out of the country at the moment, but sends her very best wishes to this conference, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and the University, I'm really delighted to welcome you all here. Uh, uh, distinguished guests, visitors, colleagues, um, it, it's going to be a fabulous conference. I've looked at the program and um, uh, a very warm welcome to you all. The University of Oxford is proud of its many and varied links and the important work it undertakes with African partners and collaborators across a range of disciplines. We are also proud of the con contribution that our staff and students from Africa make within this university, which is why I'm particularly pleased to 
be uh, speaking at this conference. As you've just heard, the, organisa the organisation is entirely conducted by a team of students. And I'd like to just again thank the organisers for the incredible work you've done to put this amazing event together. Um, so many distinguished guests and speakers and such a fantastic programme. So thank you very much. As I began by saying, Oxford is engaged in a wide range of collaborations and research projects with African partners spanning the university's four academic divisions. There are far too many projects to list individually, but to give you just a small flavour, they include the 500 plus staff at the Oxford Kemri Wellcome Trust Research Programme in Kenya, part of the Oxford Centre for Tropical Medicine, which has been conducting cutting edge research into malaria and other tropical diseases since 1989. A wildlife conservation project called Wild Crew, working in several African countries. The Global Jet Watch project, with a telescope located in a school in South Africa to encourage pupils to explore how matter behaves in black holes. And if I can just plug a research project I am personally involved with, the use of mobile phone technology to treat and manage hypertension and diabetes in communities who don't have good access to health services in southern Africa. The Africa Oxford Initiative, which, as you've just heard, is one of the sponsors of today's conference, aims to highlight and build on these many links. AFOX is a cross-country platform for collaborations between the university and African institutions. In a nutshell, it is about building and maintaining a network for all things Africa in Oxford. The initiative has achieved a huge amount in a very short time and now funds a travel grant scheme for researchers to travel between Africa and Oxford and a visiting scholars program where PhD students, postdocs and researchers and senior academic staff in African institutions can spend time in Oxford working with collaborators here. It currently has more than 300 active members in Oxford and partners with more than 100 institutions and centres in Africa. There has been active scholarship in African studies at Oxford for several centuries, and today Oxford is a leading centre for the study of Africa. The African Studies Centre within the Social Sciences Division is a focal point for graduate work and faculty research, bringing together scholars from a wide range of disciplines, including politics, history and anthropology. The centre's MSc in African Studies is recognised as Europe's most prestigious and successful teaching and training programme in its field. In terms of people, which is always our most important resource, we currently have 72 academics and researchers of African nationality and just under 400 students from the continent. We are making progress in the number of scholarship opportunities available for African students and are actively striving to expand this provision. And finally, we have over 3,000 African Oxford alumni across 46 countries on the continent. So I hope from these brief remarks you will get some sense of the very real interest and commitment Oxford has to working in Africa and with African researchers, scholars and students. This conference is an important manifestation of that commitment. The conference this year is looking to catalyse concrete action and I very much hope that being here at Oxford, facilitated by some of our brilliant students, you will do just that. Thank you. our esteemed keynote speaker, who will officially be opening the 2018 Oxford Africa Conference, Madame Monica Gengos, First Lady of the Republic of Namibia. She is a qualified lawyer, a business executive, who managed Namibia's largest private equity fund, and also a strong advocate for women and girls' rights. Prior to becoming the First Lady in 2015, she also served on the boards of large public and private sector companies as either chairperson or deputy person. She was awarded National Honours, Most Distinguished Order of Namibia, for outstanding contribution to the socio-economic development of Namibia and was inducted into the Namibian Business Hall of Fame. She has also received numerous awards, such as the Namibian Business Personality of the Year and Most Innovative Entrepreneur of the Year. Madame Gengos has previously been ranked by various global organizations and publications as one, as, as one of Africa's top 100 economic leaders. 
Due to her extensive corporate experience, she was a long-standing member of high-level policy advisory boards, such as the President's Economic Advisory Council, the Swapo Party Think Tank, and the National Council of the Namibia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, with the mandate to advise on national policy formulation and implementation. As First Lady, Madame Gengos has combined her rich experience as an entrepreneur and President Gengob's war on poverty and inequality. Through the One Economy Foundation, the First Lady has initiated numerous programs which focus on breaking the poverty cycle. A flagship project in this regard is the One Nation Fund, which provides micro-business owners who operate on the periphery of the economy access to collateral free loans, entrepreneurial training, and mentorship. Another flagship program that she has initiated is the Talent Individual Program, an education fellowship which provides talented children from low-income families the opportunity to access quality education, while concurrently developing their characters by building them with a full spectrum of financial and psychosocial support. Madame Gengos is a UNAIDS special advocate for young women and adolescent girls, this is a perfect fit with the One Economies Foundation Be Free Movement, a youth-driven program which concerns itself with the challenges holding young people back from reaching their potential. And on that note, I would like to welcome Madame Monica Gengos, First Lady of Namibia, to the floor. Thank you very much. Please allow me to stand on the protocols that have already been established um, in welcoming our special guests. When I was listening to you speak to my profile, I realized there's a gaping omission of um, what happened to her businesses. So like all women do, um, we sacrifice for our husbands. And I think the institution of first ladyism will die the day that we have more female presidents because their husbands will certainly not sacrifice their careers for their wives. So what we both did, my husband and I, because we're going to talk about patronage networks, um, what we both did without any legal obligation is we got a team of auditors from PricewaterhouseCoopers to bring in the American partners. We specifically didn't want any partners from the region because we needed a lot of distance. And they had a mandate to do three things. The first one was to test the appropriateness of our assets, particularly mine, um, and give guidance on that. The second was to prepare our assets for release, and the third was to check source. They did all three. There was no problem with my husband's. There was a small problem with the trust that he had, which had property, and most of his money was in money markets. Mine was a challenge because of the private equity fund, and we had just started the first technologically driven bank, of which I was a chairman and a shareholder. Um, we owned the biggest newspaper from a um, revenue perspective, and we printed most of the largest newspapers. So that was an obvious resignation uh, for me, as I was the chairman of that media company. And I resigned from all of the boards on which um, the private equity and fund had ownership of. There was a company which had a fishing interest, and because that was the subject of an uh, annual um, license, the perception of conflict of interest was addressed by rather selling, which I did. Um, so we disposed of everything that we had to dispose of, um, restructured, and I was allowed to keep my shareholding in the private equity fund as long as I was no longer the managing director. So everything that the auditors asked us to do, we did. But it shouldn't be an option. It should be legislated. It should be law. Um, we must be clear about conflicts of interest. So I just wanted to clarify that because when you were saying it, I, I picked it up that actually it's a loose end there that needs to be fixed. So basic test of leadership is self-leadership. Um, if you can't lead yourself, how do you lead others? And this, let's imagine for a second there's a world leader and this world leader has a Twitter account and he uses that account to act like a bully and is often petty and spiteful. We may be correct that in assuming that this leader will use his power to bully others and make petty and spiteful decisions which impact many people. 
I did a TED talk of this in 2014 called Wounded Leadership, but particularly in the context of African leadership, uh, particularly in the context of some of our leaders, Namibia included, who were in a liberation struggle. They were freedom fighters and they experienced trauma. And with that trauma, lots of it unresolved and unprocessed, they became leaders. Um, so we spoke about wounded leadership from the perspective of private sector and political leadership and the consequences of that. The answer I had then is the same answer I have today. And that is to say that our political processes globally are so fundamentally flawed that even the most democratic processes can produce suboptimal, weak and wounded leaders who spend their evenings on Twitter. <laughs> the answer thus lies in strong institutions led by strong people. What I didn't mention in that TED talk, because I didn't have that experience, is the power of those in proximity to leaders, those in proximity to power, and how they use their proximity to power. As a first lady, I don't have any power. I think the only power I have is that I don't have to make an appointment to see the president. But the real power that I do have is proximity. And I have a decision every single day of how I want to use that proximity. Do I want to use it to benefit my friends, family, and myself? Or do I want to use it to access the powerless to the powerful? Again, that's a choice I have. It depends on the type of person that I am. So it is important to analyze the people who a leader, whether a president of Oxford Africa conference or the president of a country, who those people are and the kind of influence they have over this person. So I'm talking really of our friends, our family members, our clan members, people we grew up with and we love. Africans exist within the understanding of Ubuntu which is a Nguni word which basically means I am because we are. Social networks are very important for us. Within the humanism of Ubuntu exists what millennials call black tax. The first generation degree holder, which I'm sure many of you are, or even the breadwinner of an entire family or clan pays a very high black tax. But there's another tax called, let's call it the success tax or the political tax. And there's, it's high expectations that our communities have of us once we become prominent or successful. It's request for loans. A distant relative of my husband asked for a loan of just 100 Namibian dollars. That's like 140,000 US dollars. But his perception was just 140,000 US dollars. As if it's cheap change. It's offers for all types of things and requests for all types of things. Um, we have people dropping off their CVs, their business plans, their tender documents at our homes with our children. And the worst is we have our names being whispered in the rooms where procurement decisions of government are made. Name droppers are truly the bane of my existence. And the fact that it works is indicative that there's a big problem in our processes where those who are close to us, who are seen at our birthday parties, who are seen at our homes, can go and whisper in the ear of a minister and say, the first lady is part of this deal. The president has an interest. And they will be believed because they are our relatives. They are our family. They are our friends. How do you regulate that? It's through strong processes and strong institutions. This is often reinforced by technocrats who allow this, who don't test the truth, who don't make sure that they comply with the processes. And all of these assumptions of our family members, of our friends, of our families, let me tell you, all political leaders have lots of family. I discovered that just by becoming a first lady. <laughs> but why do we have these assumptions that politicians are rich? When we go to, and this is a real story, we went to the United Nations General Assembly. And first ladies, uh, much to my frustration, are assigned secret service. So look, especially if you're an African first lady, you've got 
two normally white guys behind you, if not three, with things coming out of their ears. And often some of the shop attendants will come and whisper to me, who are they with, who are they with? And I'll be like, I don't know, who do you think they are? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it gets slipped and they realize that this is an African first lady. And very quickly, I'll be looking for dresses to wear. The government doesn't pay for my clothes. And I've got a, I've got a budget. And the minute they hear it's an African first lady, the dresses that they'll bring you are the price of a small car in Namibia. And then you'll be made to feel very guilty when you start looking at the discounted items. And you'll be told that the first lady of X country spent 100,000 US dollars last week. Now I'm made to feel guilty that I don't have your gotten gains. I'm made to question why I can't afford these expensive dresses even though I'm a first lady. But where do shop attendants, our families, our friends, and those who don't know us get the assumption that we have so much money if they know that that dress costs an annual salary in the country where I come from? So the perception, even if we don't pinpoint it, there's a perception that there is wealth that comes with position. So as much as we rail against corruption, we don't really recognize it when our loved ones or people we have influence over have access to power. And I speak about proximity to power, because all of you at some point will have proximity to power if you are not the powerful. And this is something you need to be very cautious of, because I think this is what actually fails our leaders. It's the people around them who have the ear. So that's the first practical lesson. So what am I saying? I'm saying Africa will change when Africans change, one mindset at a time. So all of us, when we have proximity to power, be someone who uses it to access power for the powerless, not to translate for your own benefit. And when you succeed, use that moment to teach those around you. Tell them the truth. Be prepared to lose friends and family who think that you're helping others and not helping them. If we must accept that the will of the people can produce weak leaders, then we must not accept weak institutions. We need strong institutions run by strong people as they provide protection against weak leaders who surround themselves with the like-minded and the weak world. Those of you who end up in institutions, you must do your work, give honest guidance. And the part that nobody really tells you is that you're likely to be fired. And that should be a price worth paying for. In countries like Namibia and many other countries who had uh, liberation wars, they're people who sacrificed their lives for the liberation of their countries. Yet we have a generation who's not willing to sacrifice a tender or lucrative state contracts for the sake of doing what's right. Another thing that I've noticed, so I'm not going to talk about things that we all agree on, the empowerment of women, the protection of children. I'm going to talk about the things that we've stopped talking about, which we must not forget about. And that's the stuff that is often resisted by us, the people. Let's talk about a quick thing, the reform of the public sector. And again, I'm going to sidetrack and I'm going to do this a lot because I think it's a flaw that I have. But I was once the deputy chairperson of the Public Office Bearers Remuneration Commission. And we paid the salaries of all the politicians. And the politicians hated us because they thought we paid them too little. And the public hated us because they thought we paid the politicians too much. So you, can't, you can never win there. But one thing I did notice is the... The, the hypocrisy that came to the payment of polit political salaries and political office bearers relative to the wage bill of the civil service. Our wage bill for political offices, I cannot speak for other African countries, it probably constitutes less than 2% of the entire wage bill. Yet, the political office bearers' remuneration and benefits is under constant public scrutiny, whereas the civil service wage bill is never questioned. Why? It's more sensational, the newspapers are more interested in it. But most African countries spend more than 80% of their budget on operational expenses, not capital expenditure. And where does that operational expenditure budget go to? What is the biggest line item? It's wages. 
Yet we don't speak about it because it's not sensational. It's, and it impacts us. It impacts our parents, it impacts our cousins, it impacts most of us. But the reality is many African countries have bloated wage bills, which needs to be reformed. We wouldn't have a problem with a large civil service if it was efficient. I'm quickly going to start reading again because this is where I get into problems and saying unnecessary things. So it's important, it's impossible to talk of changing institutional culture, particularly within a government, without mentioning the word reform. The larger the institution, the harder it is to reform it, as it's not only processes that need to change, but people also need to change. Let's look at governments in many African states. If you read the budgets carefully, most of the annual budget goes to operational expenses, particularly wages. If for one second we are saying that we value human capital as a transformative force, hence a large civil service, then we must assume that the civil service is efficient. The challenge that many of us have is an inefficient, bloated civil service where many people are unfireable and many have developed unteachable spirits and have become resistant to reform. Actually, many have become experts in resisting reform and frustrating those who try to do it. They are amazing civil servants who, do ne who never get the credit and the praise that they deserve. So I'm not talking about those ones. I'm talking about the ones that we know. I also see the frustrations of the good civil servants as they are often passed over for promotions. And many of the good ones get so frustrated that they leave. Civil service can be politicized. It can sometimes be tribalized. And the talented are usually frustrated by the untalented, if there's such a word. All of that may exist, but how do we solve our worst and most compl complex problems without applying our best talent? This basic talent problem in public sector is particularly acute at local government, which is at the forefront of basic service delivery. Part of the solution is paying professionals what they are worth, and if need be, paying private sector salaries, as the cost of higher salaries is offset by saving money on costly consultants to mop up failing projects. But the cost of an inefficient public sector is higher than the cost of paying appropriate salaries. But the minute somebody gets a high salary in the public sector, what happens? There's public outcry. They're getting paid too much. It's not worth it. We must have a better way of analyzing what is an appropriate salary for expensive professionals who need to do work from within government. My message to you, and I'm not naive of the complexity of this, but if you want to see change, you need to get into the belly of the beast. You need to get into government. You need to withstand the frustrations and change what you hate about your civil service from within. What is the point of getting the best education in the world and not using it to transform your own world? I'm sure you'll tackle me in the question and answers about working environments and conditions, and that's fine. I'm happy to have that discussion. I may have a part answer to the dilemma, to the dilemma of reform. The reform of public sector institutions must be aligned with reform in political parties. Here, I'm going to use an example of the governing party in Namibia. It's called SWAPO. SWAPO enjoys a two-thirds majority in the Namibian parliament. And so if SWAPO reforms internal processes, it has a direct and immediate impact on what happens in government. SWAPO implemented a 50-50 zebra policy for gender equality at party level. And overnight, in the next election, the representation of women in the Namibian parliament jumped from 26% to 47%. At the last Congress, SWAPO's top four leadership was also aligned according to the zebra policy. So in our top four in the party, the president is a man, the vice president of SWAPO is a woman, the secretary general of SWAPO is a woman, the deputy secretary general is a man. So this policy extended itself into the top four of the party. It extended itself into the central committee where it's 50-50, and it extended itself into the Politburo. So we do assume that by the time the next election comes and the next cabinet is chosen, even the cabinet will reflect that policy 
but it wasn't a government policy. It was the policy of a political party. So in order for many governments to reform, the political parties who are likely to win elections, including opposition parties, because there are opposition parties on the continent who are strong, they need to reform first. There are also a few interesting things that I've seen, and that's many people who have the talent that I speak about are not politically active at party level. So if you're not politically active, you'll be ruled by those who are. So if our talents stay away from political parties, you'll be ruled by those in the political parties. Again, I'm not naive. I know of a situation in my own country where, yeah, it's such a small country, they'll know exactly what I'm speaking about, but it's true, so I'm <laughs> going to say it. But the former governor of our reserve bank challenged the position of treasury of a region, not even the country, just a region. He wanted to become the treasurer. And he lost to somebody who may not have a high school qualification. And that shows that it's not always the competent and the skilled and the one with the best qualification who will emerge in the um, contestation of political parties. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. It's like in the civil service, politics can be rough, demoralizing and produce suboptimal leaders, but that's not an excuse to stay away. Partly it's the reason you should get involved. It's also not possible to talk about reform in political parties, the public sector, and avoid the topic of the private sector. There are always people within the system resisting reform, and they usually resist reform with the assistance of private sector players. Let me give you a hint of who resists reform the most. When you try to implement any new way of doing things, always ask yourself on who loses what. It's important to have a very clear picture of who those people are who stand to lose at a reform policy, because they are the ones who are going to stand in your way. Private sector has built itself, especially and I can't speak for the whole of Africa because there's many different circumstances, but many players in the private sector have built their businesses around government inefficiency. And the same private sector which calls for reforms stands in the way the moment they realize that these reforms are starting to impact the bottom line. A great example is the day when our tax authorities <coughs> wake up and they start doing retroactive um, audits of our tax, start doing lifestyle audits. The very people who cry for reform are the ones who say, no, 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 this tax authority is now a little bit too aggressive. They became complacent. When government starts to spend less, because one of the biggest things that government needs to do is control expenditure. Now they start controlling expenditure. They start spending less on workshops, traveling allowances for civil servants, rationalizing wasteful expenditure. Ask yourself who the service providers are who benefited from that largesse, and you'll know who's going to stand in the way of that reform. If you're going to work in the private sector, deal with government from a perspective of integrity, and not from the perspective of everybody does it. Also, don't build businesses with the assumption that government will always remain efficient, and then use the job losses that will result from government efficiency as a reason why they shouldn't implement reform. So build sustainable businesses and have integrity when you deal with government. Talking of vested interests, I also need to speak on inequality. And again, those who benefit from inequality will always redirect an inequality discussion to a poverty eradication discussion. Why? Because it shifts the discussion from what the wealthy must do with their capital to what should be done for the poor in relation to income. Get a job, get an education is usually the response, but the reality is that income flows downwards, capital flows upwards. You need to dissolve, you need to resolve both. Inequality will never be resolved without the participation of the wealthy. In Namibia and South Africa specifically, this discussion has taken a racial angle, which is somewhat unnecessary, because I've seen wealthy black Namibians opposing inequality-related reform simply because it impacts their wealth. It has nothing to do with their color. The point I'm making is that inequality is about those who have more 
than they need relative to those who have nothing. Namibia and South Africa have the unenviable position of being the first and second most unequal countries in the world. So we'll need to have the first and second most radical inequality-focused measures in the world as well, if we are to resolve it. What do we need there? We need more wealthy people to be woke, as you guys would say. <laughs> to speak up against their own privilege, as capital has rules, and you simply cannot change how capital flows without understanding its very complex rules. It's trying to change the flow of capital is like getting into the ocean without understanding the basics of how tides work and not being able to swim. The ocean will simply swallow you and act like you never existed. So to those who understand economic issues, get involved in understanding the very complex and real issues of structural inequality and get involved in fixing them. When I talk of capital fighting back, please believe me, capital fights back. I have often, from the vantage point of the private sector, seen regulations issued from government regulators, which are flawed, deeply flawed. And I've also seen how, in the private sector, very expensive teams of lawyers, of accountants, of um, subject matter experts are quickly assembled with the sole focus of demolishing that flawed regulation, even though the principle of why the regulation was thought of may be right. It's how that regulation gets drafted by the inexperienced, where they, on a technical point, can have these things thrown out. Then I see how some regulators are either too junior or inexperienced to stand their ground. So what they do is they hide behind regulatory arrogance and public sector power to say, you will do what I say. Because it's harder to say no than to consider the valid points. And before you know it, that regulation has been thrown out and it's back to the drawing board. So private sector does frustrate reform and regulatory reform that impacts it. And I'm not defending how regulation is sometimes done um, in our countries, where there is very little consultation. There are deep flaws in it which must be corrected, but the, the, the principle is not to throw out why the reform is required in the first place. So what I'm saying is that governments require the right knowledge and skill to produce common sense regulations which they can defend to the affected industries and to the people. This is also true of our negotiation teams, which negotiate large loan agreements or trade agreements with large countries. You hear anecdotally of trade negotiation teams of up to 20 members comprising of lawyers, auditors, and all types of experts from a Western country negotiating a trade deal with four or five middle management African civil servants. In whose favor do you think those loan and trade agreements will be slanted? We speak a lot to the shocking agreement signed by some of our governments, but we also need to speak to the skill and capacity of those who negotiate those deals. Again, it's a talent problem, where the talented are not at the core face of where the technical details of these agreements are hashed out. A more concerning aspect is how aid is being used by Western countries to bully developing countries to open up their borders and trade on very unequal terms. These same Western countries are the ones who release reports on the glaring income inequalities in our countries and warning us that we better do something about it as a matter of urgency. Global trade agenda is exacerbated, is exacerbating inequality in developing economies as they aren't giving developing countries an opportunity to build their own industries and their own entrepreneurs. And many of these countries have inherited deeply flawed structural, deeply deep structural flaws. And global capital insists we must build our economies on top of these flaws and not waiting for us to fix them first. Global capital understands that external, our external trade is low in developing countries, and what is happening is we are being forced to remain net importers of goods and services and maintain low levels of industrialization and high unemployment. This is illogical. It doesn't make sense. We must industrialize. We must employ more people. And the economic argument for that is simple. The more people who are employed, the larger the markets we have of people who can buy products. Instead, many developing countries are being bullied into trade agreements which aren't fair and which entrench inherent economic fault lines. How do you help? 
It's, all, it's safe to say that markets are often a reflection of the social prejudices and injustices of the society they operate in. If there is prejudice based on ethnicity, race or gender, it will reflect in the allocation of resources. So if you end up in the marketplace, don't perpetuate inequality. If you end up on the other side of negotiation teams, have integrity. Be respectful and challenge institutional views which are inconsistent with the basics of fair opportunity. Inequality is about unequal power distribution and unequal playing grounds. Don't become that negotiator. Be the person who understands that the great privilege of power comes with a great responsibility to the underprivileged. We often fight for a seat at the table so that we can share in the meal. We need to fight for a seat at the table so that we can transform the menu and extend the table so more can be seated. And if we have the right people in the right institutions, we will inevitably make the right decisions. The corrupt, the incompetent, and the entitled are not the same but they have a shared interest in resisting reform, as none of them have an interest in an efficient, transparent, and accountable public service. My husband has a great formula. Um, his formula is T plus R equals, no, wait, 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 wait. Trust and, our, and accountability equals, no, 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 no. <laughs> Transparency and accountability equals trust. T plus A equals trust. And I always tell him, but your formula is wrong. Your formula ignores the incompetent and the corrupt. Because you need to take those two and minus the impact. Because it's not the same person. Somebody can be competent, but they're corrupt. And they'll go into bed with somebody who's incompetent, who's not corrupt because both of them do not want transparency, because both of them will lose access to influence through transparency. So the entitled guy, the corrupt guy, and the incompetent guy can be three different people, but they will be united in resisting you. So transparency, accountability, deduct the corrosive effect of those three guys, and then you have trust, because they do fight back. And often they make those who are trying to reform look like the thieves. We have that situation developing right now in Namibia. And I read a book last week written by um, Ngozi, the former Nigerian Minister of Finance, which talks about this very issue. And when I read that book, I got such a fright because exactly, we can change, many people confuse Namibia and Nigeria anyway, but you can change a lot of the issues that she wrote about and put it into any African country, and it would be true. So, To be reformers, you must understand delayed gratification, as it does come with a cost. You will not be liked with those, by those who have something to lose. Nobody has graduated from any university with a degree in being very liked. So be true to your qualifications and apply your degrees for socioeconomic transformation. Lend your access to the powerful, to the powerless, and use your education to solve the problems of the uneducated. Apply your voice for the voiceless because this is Ubuntu. I am because we are. When we apply our voices, I'm mindful that at times we pay attention to who says something as opposed to what was said. Countries benefit when diverse views are in a position to challenge leaders. And listening to people who you disagree with isn't a weakness, it's a strength. There are those who engage in destructive criticism and that's okay. It's their right. But I'm speaking about those who have constructive criticism to give that is simply never heard. I have some advice which may be unpopular. When trying to get a message across, be mindful of the context in which you operate. African dialogue is not direct. You don't come straight to a point or just name an issue as it is. We start with an extended greeting where you ask how the person is, how the children are, has it rained, how are the crops doing. We both know what I'm here for, but we are first going to have a very extended greeting. Then extensive small talk, how are the neighbors, how is the church? And then by the use of parables of a fox that runs very fast, must always take care of the tortoise that is a little bit slower. I mentioned my point and it's understood. And by the next day, whatever issue I had discussed in parables is fixed. I'm not saying don't be direct. What I'm saying is understand the context 
when you speak and who you're speaking to. And understand the power of how you say something as opposed to what you say. Two people with exactly the same critical view can use two different approaches and get different outcomes. One will use their megaphone, be quoted extensively in the media, and be seen to be telling truth to power. But I've also seen people not use a megaphone, use a different approach, say exactly the same thing as what that person on the megaphone said, and they get heard. So which one of the two are more powerful? It's the one where action came from what they had to say. No headlines, no drama, just an understanding of how to deal within their context. If you want to be an activist, be so. But by all means, please try activism that is measured by effectiveness and use all your tools at your disposal to be effective. There's a tendency for insult dialogue. And I view it as one of the least effective tools. And it's often disheartening to see young people with valid points allow their objections and their points be drowned out by their insults. Because one thing I know about politicians, and I'm married to one, so I know this very well, is that they're very good at not hearing insults. So if there's a valid point attached to that insult, that valid point gets lost as well. So if you want your valid points to be heard, find a way of addressing your issue in a way that it still reaches the ears. To those of you who find yourself in the system, don't defend weaknesses. Fix them. To those on the outside, provide shovel-ready solutions. Finding problems is very easy. Getting involved with the difficult stuff and resolving some of these issues is the difficult part. We have all dealt with the deadly task of changing the minds of our parents. And we all know how that discussion can quickly go from what you said to how you said it. Very quickly, all your aunts will be called, all your uncles will be told how you came from university with an attitude problem, how disrespectful you've become, how now you think with your Oxford degree you think you know everything. So if our parents are like this, most authority figures are no different. Talking about parents, we need to talk about parenting. We need to talk about African parenting in the 21st century. So when we talk about the African way, we must be mindful of what constitutes constructive parenting and what is harmful. What we say about our Ubuntuness and who we are as Africans is not reflecting in our statistics. Fathers who don't take responsibility for their children is un-African. Gender-based violence is un-African. The forced sexual debut of one in three young girls in Southern Africa is un-African. We need to reevaluate what we say our values are as Africans and reconcile them to our actions that are showing up in the statistics and how we treat our poor and vulnerable. A key part of this process is reevaluating harmful traditional practices and beliefs, as well as addressing religious and traditional leaders who manipulate and abuse those who they have authority over. Many of us were raised by parents, grandparents, or relatives who had unresolved trauma or problematic traditional beliefs, which they pass on through the generations. We, in turn, pass our generational trauma and our generational scars to our own children. And that cycle has to stop. We must address the dysfunction in our homes, the dysfunction in our societies, as part of addressing the dysfunction in Africa. What we need to address a lot of this dysfunction is reliable and timely data. What we need is for social interventions to become the norm in our developmental approach. Also, as we assess these uniquely African attributes, we also need to agree which Africa are we talking about. I heard Njodi speak just now about Southern Africa, West Africa, East Africa, North Africa, Central Africa, and the African diaspora. We even still speak about Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa is probably the upgraded version of the, what is re referred to when it was okay to be a racist as black Africa. 
So it is true. Africa does remain balkanized on colonial fault lines into worse than just East Africa, Southern Africa. There is still Anglophone, Francophone, Lusophone, Arabia. In the days of black Africa, that was excluding North Africa, now we say Sub-Saharan. We remain divided on colonial fault lines. The issues in North Africa are indeed different from those in Southern Africa, which are starkly different from West Africa. But to be frank, the language groupings are problematic, and we see it in the voting patterns in continental bodies, like the African Union, like the Pan-African Parliament, where voting is done on regional solidarity and language solidarity rather than on principle. What we need is an Africa, an African solidarity based on principles, not language, not region, not ethnicity. Africa united on Pan-African principles remains an ideal. We need a resurgence of Pan-Africanists who can challenge the narrative of a hopeless continent and inspire all of us to believe in the ability of our countries and our continents. And this doesn't require you to be in politics. The decolonization of our education systems, our judiciary, I'm glad we've got a, sitting, a, a former Chief Justice here. Our economies, our thought processes does not depend on politicians alone, it depends on us. A practical solution as part of decolonizing our education is to teach critical thinking and reasoning as a school subject. How else can we improve the standard of political debate in our countries? We can learn from bigger democracies of the dangerous rise of the belligerent and the bellicose simply because they dominate news cycles and they manage to suppress informed debate by telling lies and questioning the truth and really relying on parts of the population who don't know the difference. I'm mindful of time, so I'd like to leave some of these thoughts. We, we can always get into detail during the question and answer session, but really the first point is get into the belly of the beast, whether it's a political party, a local government, state-owned enterprise, civil service, and apply your skill and knowledge in a, transformat in a transformative way. If you do end up in the private sector, don't perpetuate inequalities and unjust behavior. Ensure your voice is effective by ensuring that your message is never lost in the noise and that you fix what is broken. And of course, Pan-Africanism. The movie Black Panther is a reminder that the African child needs positive role models. We need superheroes. We need to build, build not break. We need Pan-African intellectuals and thoughts to run our education systems, our NGOs, our private sector, and our politics. A Pan-African can never be sexist, paternalistic, xenophobic, homophobic, tribalistic, as a Pan-African understands that inclusion and not exclusion is the glue that holds us together and allows us to move in the same direction. My husband loves the Swahili word harambe, as we can't progress or prosper if we are not united and moving in the same direction. We have a generation of brave men and women who risked and sacrificed their lives to see change in their political orders. Now we need a generation of brave men and women who are willing to risk their livelihoods to change the socioeconomic order. And all of you are here because somebody believed in you, saw something in you that you didn't see yourself. And the same is true for our countries. We must believe in them. We must see the full potential of what our countries can achieve and do everything in our power to see the realization of that potential. Thank you very much. Madam Gengos, thank you so much for honoring our invitation today to speak. I'm sure you have prompted many thoughtful questions in the audience as well as the role of young people, I would say, in African politics, uh, the role of young people in economics, the role of young people when it comes to issues of the continent. And I think I am very much moved by your speech um, of moving into the nature and the belly of the beast rather than staying out of it if we are to truly change our, our continent. Thank you very much. We are now going to move into a conversation and question and answer session between my colleague Zua Matondo, who is an MPP candidate here at the Blavatnik School of Government, as well as the founder of Gov Enhance Africa, 
with the First Lady. I will now hand over to you. Thank you. Is my mic on? Everyone can hear me? Madam First President, thank you so much for that Ooh, very... First Lady, whoa, 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 don't bring me problems, First Lady. <laughs> I'm not which, trying to be a president. <laughs> which, well, I'm sorry. Um, but I just wanted to, to say that I'm quite implored to write an email to the dean of our school yeah. and, uh, and ask that you be given some sort of lecture spot because that was full of meat for a lot of people who are interested in good governance. And I think it's been an honor to have you here. Okay. And I wanted to just explore some of the points you were, you were touching on during your speech. And one of the ones you ended on especially was the issue of pan-Africanism. Yes. Um, I believe that unfortunately over the last you know, 30 or so years, pan-Africanism has you know, been killed by some of, one would say some of its, its founders, some of its founding fathers, and some of its founding parties. Um, we've seen leaders across the continent grab onto power, um, use the law to prolong their own rule. Um, and there's been a deafening silence often from their peers on condemning them and holding them accountable. And that's been a big frustration, especially for, for young Africans. What mechanisms do you think um, could be put in place to really hold leaders accountable from other African countries when it comes to issues of, you know, using unconstitu unconstitutional means to either stay in power or changing the constitution to stay in power? I think the challenge with that mm. is people hate it when I say it, but you often get the leader you deserve because some of these unpopular leaders have their own constituencies and support bases. Mm. How does another African country if Namibia has a problem, how does a Zimbabwean leader come to Namibia and remove a president elected by his people in a sham election or not, and without military force? It's not easy. So I think we don't give the African Union enough credit for their decision not to recognize leaders who come or stay through unconstitutional means. And that has had an impact. It's, it's, it's not often where you see a leader who blatantly stole election be accepted by the African Union. So I think there has been a little bit of a change there. Mm -hmm. But there's also an interesting dynamic where we like to think that it's all the leaders who are clinging to power. And if you look at right now the profile of the leaders who are clinging to power, a lot of them are quite young. Mm. So, so I think I'm not sure how another country changes regimes for another country without creating a bigger mess. We've seen the examples. Um, internationally. But I do think that there's a very serious role for SADC, for the African Union, and for these regional constellations to play a bigger role. But be mindful of what I said earlier. What is the purpose of taking a megaphone and critiquing another leader in the media when you see one another and have private sessions, which I do believe are quite robust, where they do criticize one another? The fact that it doesn't get into the media doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But if you have somebody intent on clinging to power, who refuses to leave, who refuses to listen to reason, how does another country change that? So I think that pressure must always come from within. So do you think the African Union can have more of a say? Um, we understand that the African Union doesn't have a lot of... Um, its funding from its member states. A lot of funding does come from external sources, which often ties their hands as to what they can do. For even, for example, in Burundi, when we had the crisis, um, you know, there was an, an, an urge to, to send some sort of peacekeeping troops. But quite frankly, you know, to send a, a, peace trip, a, a peacekeeping troop is extremely expensive. Um, what ways can we give the AU more teeth without necessarily circumventing state sovereignty, but still being able to hold other leaders accountable. Because I think we shouldn't just say um, African leaders uh, have been elected by sham or not by their own people, therefore we must step aside. I think as Africans we have a duty to be able to influence uh, in a positive way uh, another country when in crisis. Correct. There's a set of AU reforms being championed by President Kagame and a group of five reformers. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and part of the Continental Free Trade Agreement is that a percentage of, I think it's export revenue, is going to start going to funding the African Union or something to that extent. And I think the reason they're doing that is exactly to circumvent what you're saying and to say that whoever pays your bills determines your positions on issues. So I think that move is really to get more independence, but also to have the necessary funding to take action when it's clearly required. And if I can sort of move on to a more domestic level, when you're talking of young people, I mean, most of our delegates here are young people uh, who are very passionate about their continent, very passionate about their countries. And could you give some other ways in which people can get involved in impacting their their communities and their nations without necessarily going into politics because or even into public service in terms of the institutions could you give some sort of advice as to what other areas they can practically go into to have some sort of political influence so to me there are times where you find opposition leaders who are excellent and they push for change. You find social agitators who are doing a great job of critiquing their governments, and whether the government admits it or not, they do pay attention and change. So it is possible to be the person outside of the system who applies enough pressure to get some changes to happen. You're not going to be popular for it, you're not going to make money from it, but you will get results. So it is possible to make a change from outside, but personally, especially in countries with very dominant governing parties, um, I've often found that the strongest opposition is from within. If you look at the politics within your own country, Zimbabwe, if you look at the politics within South Africa, the people who oppose one another the most are within the same party. And I think we must learn as societies to recognize who are the reformers in our governing parties and give them the necessary support because they fight daily battles with the hardliners in the same party mm. to restrain, to restrict, to talk down, to calm down, to prevent. And when these reformers <coughs> inside these parties who are doing such an amazing job do not get the support of the people, our biggest risk is that they get fed up and they leave mm. because then all you left with in these parties are the hardliners. So support the reformers in the big parties if you don't have a strong opposition. Mm. If you have a strong opposition, that is a key and obvious requirement. You need a strong independent media. You need a free and independent judiciary. All of those institutional requirements are there as well. But to me, the change in these big parties will always be the party itself. Political mm. parties like ZANU-PF, ANC, SWAPO, um, and throughout the countries that earned independence through liberation, People believe in the party. I wonder if these parties will have the uh, people within ready to nudge others out and in a soft way. It's happened. Your military. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can write a how-to book on that. Um, and again, just not to belabor the point too much, but, uh, you know, of course we know Africa has this demographic dividend. And, you know, in about 20 years, we're going to have the largest amount of young people um, under the age of 35 in the entire world. And a major issue as I've traveled around Africa and as I've met many people such as yourself uh, and we've discussed is the issue of jobs. Jobs being created and empowering young people to be economically um, um, stable and independent. You have your, your, your One Nation Fund, and uh, it, it provides a lot of funding for, 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 for young entrepreneurs as well. What other solid solutions do you think young people can pursue uh, or can be pursued to ensure that this bulge that we have is not going to be, um, you know, quite frankly, a disaster for us in 20 years? And as they normally say, we can... You know, we can have all these democratic institutions around us, but people can't eat democracy. Okay. So how would you address that? It's to address the structural issues. Mm. Um, the same African countries with these exceptionally high unemployment statistics are the ones who boast of high um, growth data. Um, and what it's saying to us is that it's jobless growth. Mm. It's um, a negation of trickle-down economics where your GDP is growing, but your people are not, are not mm -hmm. and that you're not creating jobs. 
Um, so we need to change the structures of our economies, and that's what I was speaking about, where we are being prevented from industrializing by very aggressive international trade policies. We, especially the resource-based um, countries, are speaking a lot about value addition. But when you speak about value addition, you're speaking about manufacturing. When you're speaking about manufacturing, you need a skilled mm -hmm. workforce. Mm -hmm. And a lot of countries are failing somewhat on quality education. Many of us are talking about free education. Namibia mm -hmm. also has free secondary education, but it's a quality education. Um, does a poor person's child get the same education that my child gets? If the answer is no, then it's difficult to speak about credible value addition because you do not have the skill set um, to do value addition. Mm -hmm. so, there's, so those kind of structural problems have to be addressed in order to grow jobs. So young people on their own can do very little. But quickly, just three principles. And it's principles I heard. It's, it's, we apply them. But it's the principles for young people of developing confidence, providing capital, and growing capacity. Those mm. three Cs, to me, are important. I've seen people with capacity who lack confidence. Mm. I've seen people with confidence and capital who lack, ah, sorry, confidence and capacity who lack capital. So you need all three for young people to be productive uh, economically, and we need to develop all three. I absolutely agree. And um, I would love to ask you more questions, but I think probably some of the, the audience members have some interesting questions to add. And I'd like to invite the floor to ask a few questions. We'll take maybe a, a couple of three. So please make it very brief. Introduce yourself. Uh, and your question, rather a question than an interjection, if you will. I know the African in us who want to make a statement, but <laughs> for time's sake. So if anyone has a question for Madame Genghis, um, let's start with a lady, actually, if we can have a lady. All right, well, she had her hand up first. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Elena. Elena. Hello, and, and thank you for being here. My name is Zuna Tijani. I'm from Sudan. Um, and my question is about your Be Free um, initiative. I would like to know what are the main lessons that have been learned from that, and um, what kind of motivated you to start this, and if this is part of a legacy you're considering. Okay. I think um, just to give uh, her some time to understand some of the questions. We'll take another question, and then we'll, we'll have a go right ahead. Hi, um, I'm Christy. I'm from Namibia, and I currently live here in Oxford. <laughs> um, it's an honor to meet you, Madam First Lady. My thing is, as an artist, I'm a, a poet, a writer. Um, how it's always been a passion for artists to get involved in politics, mm. but I don't see that happening much um, in the African societies, and I know that arts can be a very powerful medium to get to the communities, and um, I just wanted to know how can we press that um, to inspire our artists. I think most of the people are afraid to get a uh, politics into their arts. I think it's a very powerful medium to actually do that. So um, I think people need to stand up more. And, but I'd like to hear from your position, um, especially as a Namibian uh, living here, I watch what's going on in the country and I feel I have so much to say and to write about. But um, how can we inspire our young people, our artists, to actually use the, their talent their voices to speak up and to be part, to get in the belly of the beast, as you said. Thank you. Thank you. I think if you want to uh, go ahead and address those two questions. The arts one is difficult because it, 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 it's, it's a funding issue. If you look at some of our, our greatest artists that, this con that Africa has produced, the Filakutis, the Maria Makebas, they were more popular and made more money from outside the continent mm. than from within. And that's what gave them the ability to sing and perform the type of protest um, arts that they engaged in. They were funded from outside. Uh, just our mainstream artists have a funding problem, never mind the political ones. So I don't have the answer to that question. I don't know. I don't know where you're going to get the funding that gives you um, enough to survive on. Um, 
when you engage in, in, in uh, politics and arts. So I, the, the, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, but an obvious answer is government to provide more funding um, for the arts. The, the second one on be free, a lot of my talking points that I spoke about here um, has got to do with learnings of the be free movement. So just quickly, the be free movement is an initiative that we're rolling out in all 14 regions in Namibia, and we've done a few in Zimbabwe. We've done one in Harlem in, in, in um, New York. We've done, where else did we do one? We had a conversation in Geneva. And what we do is we assemble young people, and we speak to them about difficult subjects. Um, but we allow them to deal with the issues. So we will have, we'll touch on very sensitive topics. So we'll normally have psychologists and social workers who just, who look for signs of obvious distress because inevitably the discussion comes to issues of sexual consent, of um, unreported sexual violence, of parenting techniques that are destructive, of growing up without a father, of uh, a grandparent not being able to communicate with the child that they're raising because the generational gap is, is too large. And then we'll also have panels of young people, and we'll have parents in the audience as well, and parents will articulate their frustration. Young people articulate their frustration. And then we have police officers we, talking about their experience on the street. We have um, many inmates um, currently incarcerated, especially young men who speak about how they found themselves incarcerated. And a lot has to do with fatherlessness, lack of love, uh, growing up in homes where they witnessed lots of violence, where they themselves as boys were sexually assaulted and never reported it, and feelings of extreme anger um, and resentment to what their mothers are doing, maybe in terms of a new husband or a new partner or the other way around. Um, we dealt, so there's lots of traumatic issues um, that come out. Children who have to live with alcoholic parents, poverty, mm. Um, the bullying on school grounds. Um, and that's why I speak about the importance of parenting, especially in the African context in the 21st century. <coughs> that's why I speak about bullies, because the school you had bully becomes a president, and then you have a problem. Mm. Um, because they don't change. And our, our schools have become bullying hotspots. Um, we're dealing with children... Um, who are addicted to marijuana a lot in Namibia, but we don't have a single publicly funded um, rehabilitation center. So if a child under the age of 18 is addicted to uh, drugs or has an alcohol problem, there's literally nowhere where they can go for rehabilitation. So Be Free has taught me a lot, um, and we use these talking points to inform change within the system, and it's, it's, it's working, it's quite effective. Um, and we need to process trauma better as African countries. We need to speak more about mental health. I'm glad it's on your program. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to integrate it into our socioeconomic developmental plans. Um, if I had it my way, every single school would have a nurse who hands out contraceptives and also have a social worker who processes trauma. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we are uh, at time. And uh, one thing that I would say is that I've been informed uh, that you, you may be staying the entire conference, mm -hmm. and I, I know you are extremely approachable, as I've learned over the last hour or so uh, and before. And I'm sure um, it will be nice for delegates to come up and, and ask a few more questions and have a more of a one-on-one -on -one session, uh, if time will allow you, during your, your busy stay here. So, again, thank you, uh, Madam Gengos, for for your amazingly insightful and inspirational and practical talk, which is again what we are trying to do here at the Africa Officer Conference, which is move beyond whether we can have more solid um, recommendations and solutions to some, some of the t issues we're trying to tackle. Okay. So I'm just going to give the floor to Nicolo. So if we can just also give a hand. First Lady. As a token of our appreciation, we would like to give you this gift and uh, to say that we are really, really proud and thankful to host you as a fellow African at Oxford. And you have given us much to think about as young Africans who have a duty to the continent as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I do that? Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will now move into the next part of our session for this afternoon, which is the Innovation Fair. And uh, it will kick start off with the Innovation Fair keynote, which will be given by Mr. C.D. Glynn, the President and CEO of the United States African Development Foundation. Each year, the role of the Innovation Fair at the Africa Conference is to bring up young Africans from the continent to speak about their ideas and topics that they've developed within the continent itself. And we are very happy that this year it is up and running. And I'm going to call on my colleague Dion Wilson who will introduce our keynote speaker for the Innovation Fair. Excellency, the First Lady of Namibia, distinguished speakers, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to the 2018 Oxford Africa Conference Innovation Fair. This year we received an astonishing number of applications and we are very proud and excited to share with you today the stories of ingenuity and creativity that our finalists embody. This fair is far more than a competition. It's a celebration of talent and innovation on the continent. We call it a fair because we want to celebrate the nameless and faceless individuals who are working tirelessly in education, healthcare, renewable energy, in charities and more to move Africa to the place it should be. It is our hope that today you will be inspired and motivated by the stories that are shared. So to begin the Innovation Fair, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the Innovation Fair, C.D. Glynn, and I'll just give a short bio of you if you are okay with that. <laughs> I'll try my best. C.D. Glynn is the president and CEO of the U.S. African Development Foundation, an independent U.S. government agency established by the U.S. Congress to support and invest in African-owned and led enterprises which improve lives and livelihoods in poor and vulnerable African communities. Utilizing the principles of venture philanthropy, USADF provides seed capital grant funding and local implementation and advisory support to start up in early stage African social enterprises, entrepreneurs and grassroots cooperatives. Prior to joining USADF, President Glynn was based in Nairobi, Kenya, as the Associate Director for Africa for the Rockefeller Foundation, and previously served as a White House appointee with the Peace Corps as the agency's first Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and Global Partnerships. C.D. Glynn was Vice President for Business Development at PYXERA, Global, where he managed international business advisory and corporate responsibility programs to Fortune 500 companies and earlier consulted for the State Department, USAID, and the World Bank in Ghana and Nigeria. He served as a, as a volunteer in the first Peace Corps South Africa group during the presidency of Nelson Mandela. C.D. Glynn holds a BA in political science from Howard University a master's certificate in business management from Tulane University, and postgraduate diploma in strategy and innovation from our very own Oxford University Said Business School. He was a team member of the Council of Foreign Relations and in 2011 was designated by the White House as a champion of change for his commitment and contributions to international service and civic participation. With a round of applause, can we please welcome C.D. Glenn. Thank you, thank you, Dion. Thank you, Africa, Oxford Africa Conference uh, leadership team. When I hear that introduction, I wanna be looking around, like who's, who's that person that is being 
um, described <clears throat> because at the end of the day, I just feel I'm a servant, a servant to really helping um, individuals transform their lives and have been fortunate and blessed in different ways to be a part of organizations that have that same level of, of commitment. And when you give of yourself, you know, good things happen. And so um, that's why I'm really, really honored to be here today. Madam First Lady, it was, it was uh, a pleasure hearing, hearing from you. In the early 90s, I spent some time in Namibia. The country is beautiful. As I said, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in, in South Africa. Um, spent a lot of time the past 20 years on the, on the continent and recently moved back to Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and what's interesting is that this Oxford Africa Conference and the Innovation Fair sort of bring together almost all aspects of my life in, in one way or another. <clears throat> Again, my life and dedication is dedicated and committed to African um, development. And so obviously, I, if I hear there's a conference on Africa happening, then I uh, want to be a part of it and want to figure out how to get on a plane and come. I just didn't know what was happening this weekend. And so I only got here this morning and I thought, wow, this Africa conference at Oxford is going to be massive because there were so many people at the airport in the U.S. coming to the U.K. I was like, what is happening? What is happening? And I said, are you guys all coming to the Oxford Africa conference? And they're like, um, there's a wedding happening this weekend. <laughs> So my, uh, my wife and, and three, three little girls, they know that I travel a lot and they're usually not interested in some of the places that I go because I'm in sometimes rough and tumble places, Bujumbura or, or uh, Agadez, Niger, some shout out to Burundi, um, some, 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 really, some really interesting places. So they're always interested, but they were just actually extra interested this weekend because they're saying, wow, you'll be able to say you, you were in London or in the UK during the time of the royal wedding. So it was really, really um, funny. But there's a, a massive amount of people from the, from the US coming, uh, coming here. <clears throat> so African development, obviously a, a reason for, for being Oxford, Oxford uh, answers an email or makes a call, and I'm I'm there. So definitely happy happy to be here. And it just so happens that I didn't study arts or philosophy or public management or education at Oxford. I studied something that is is true to this afternoon. <clears throat> I studied strategy and and innovation, and so I came here. Um, to learn about innovation, and I'm glad to be here back to talk a little bit about what the organization I lead, what we do in, in terms of spurring and, and utilizing African innovation to transform Africa. So we heard a lot um, previously about a number, a number of things, but I think, you know, from an American standpoint, when you, read, when you read the theme of the conference, enough rhetoric catalyzing an era of concrete action, that sounds very, sounds very you know, Oxford-esque, if you will, very, very highfalutin, if you would, if, if I could say that in our American colloquial sayings. But the way we would say it is sort of talk is cheap. You know, actions speak louder than words. Let's, let's figure out how to, how to get some things done. And that's what, what my um, organization and agency is dedicated and committed, committed to. It really is about using innovation and African-inspired innovation to get things done to actually make change and transformation on the, on the continent. <clears throat> and this word innovation is sort of the buzzword of all buzzwords. We hear it every day about every single thing. It's actually, it was ranked the number one word that is in the most amount of LinkedIn profiles um, of, of people on, on LinkedIn. Everyone's innovative, everyone has, you know, innovation in their bones, and so it's the num it's, it is the buzzword. But I do want to break down a little bit of what some of what I learned here at Said, and, and just when I think about innovation, what, is it, what does it really mean? And so if we want to have some working definitions, you can think of innovation as a break from previous practice, a break from a continuous practice, from a past practice, something, let's just say, new, um, different, novel, but then Everything new or different or novel isn't necessarily innovative because you need another side. In addition to the break from the continuous practice, it needs to be useful. It needs to be needed. Is it something that's new and novel but also needed? And that's when you really see innovation at, it, at its best. You're breaking from a past practice. You're doing something different. And you're also doing something that's needed, solving a problem, something that's useful. And therein lies sort of how we look at, at the African Development Foundation, how we look at innovation and spurring and, and catalyzing and funding um, innovation. <clears throat> Dion mentioned some of what we do. And I don't want to go into a whole um, 101 about 
the U.S. African Development Foundation. But it's, it's interesting to say that we were started as an innovation, an innovation in global development from the U.S. standpoint. So the, the U.S. government's number one, our, our, our global agency for, for development, is called the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. Um, and so it was established in the 60s. And 20 years after the establishment of USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, a number of people in Congress and a number of people who are practitioners in development sort of said, we've been doing this for 20 years. We have this model, uh, really a procurement model. We fund as American government-funded uh, entity. We fund American international organizations and NGOs to go around the world and do for people and to help them out and we and to build their capacity. So we're doing the doing, we're doing the giving, and our organizations are actually the ones on, on the ground. And they said, wow, what if we wanted to innovate in development? What if we wanted to do development differently? What would that really take? It would still take finances, and that's why I think your answer, um, Madam First Lady, was, was great around the question around the, the arts. I mean, money, money is part of access to capital is a real thing. It's part of the solution for any, any transformational change that's, that's taking place. So we need to still be in, as the U.S. government, in the business of some kind of catalytic capital or funding. But it was sort of saying, hmm, if AID, if USAID has, has one model of, of development, is there What's, what's a different model? How could we sort of find something that's still novel and still useful? And we said, what if, what if we had grants, grant financing, seed capital, and we actually didn't give it to an American NGO to go over and pay someone like C.D. Glenn 200,000 pounds and have a nice house and my girls go to the best schools and then I'm working with poor and vulnerable populations. What if we skipped that middle part and we just took some of that money and we gave it to the local communities? And what if we linked them with not international, American, or even British NGOs? What if we found African organizations that know the local context, that have the business acumen, that have the project management skills and capabilities to work with that farmers cooperative? What if we, what if we did that? What if we gave the capital directly to the community groups, to the populations that we're trying to quote unquote help, and we also link them with support because it's always more than money, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. It's always more than money. You need management skills. You need real capability. You need some, some support. You need organizational assistance. But that can come from Africans, too. We're going to the same schools, whether it's Howard University in D.C. or it's Oxford in the U.K. <clears throat> so what if, what if we did that? What if we innovated in development in that way? And therein came the foundation of the U.S. African Development Foundation. Our total mission is to support, to fund, to um, invest in Africans and their ideas. And 100 percent of our funding goes directly to African-led, African-managed organizations. And we link them, again, with technical assistance, with business advisory support, with the things that are more than money to help them succeed, but they're local organizations. So if we're in Uganda, our Ugandan team, the team I have in Uganda is 100% Ugandan. If we're in Burundi, 100% uh, Burundian. If we're in Nigeria, Ghana, whatever countries, we're in 20 different countries in the, um, the Sahel, in the Horn, and in Great Lakes. And then we also have programs and operations in, um, in Southern Africa right now, in Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, and Malawi. We actually used to be uh, for a long time in, in Namibia. Um, <clears throat> so this, mod, this, this innovation is how we came to be to really say, if you're going to do development differently, what are some ways in which you would do that? You would say, hmm, local ownership. Local ownership of, of the programs. You'd sort of say community driven. You'd look at things that really had, as I said, African, African management. So we were established to disrupt development in a very, very unique way. And we wanted it to be accountable and outcome oriented and sustainable. So that's what we do. We invest in African organizations, grassroots organizations, African social um, entrepreneurs, social enterprises, and give them some seed capital, give them some technical support, and then watch them grow and become self-reliant, not dependent on our quote unquote aid. But, depend, but we're investing in their ideas and their solutions all over, all over the, the continent. And what areas do we do that? It's an obvious question. This is a really, obviously, a brilliant audience. Let's just call out what are some of the sort of development challenges that Africa faces now? Someone on this side of the room. Development challenges, any? 
capacity building, some real skills. You're just scratching your head. <laughs> challenges, challenges facing Africa. Obvious, no brainer questions. Climate change, climate change, infrastructure, lack thereof, corruption, basic education, health care, youth unemployment. All of these, all of these is a massive amount of challenges. And so we don't sit in Washington, D.C. and sort of say when we're going to go to a country where we're deciding what the challenge is and we have a rubric for what we're going to do, we are what's called demand responsive. So we have our teams on the ground meet with local communities, meet with organizations, and actually ask them those same very questions. In your communities, what challenges are you facing? So when we're designing programs, they really are locally led, locally managed, and they are meeting challenges that the communities themselves have identified. Now again, they sometimes don't know what to ask for, and that's why you really need to work with them, because you don't know that you may need, you know, if, if you say, hey, we know we need a tractor to till our land, but is it a... 25 horsepower tractor is a 250 power horse tractor. I've never bought a tractor. So you need some support and technical assistance to help people you know, move, move along their way and transform their lives. But we really don't become prescriptive. We respond to those local demands. And for us to be able to really have the kind of impact that we really need to have, we can't be all things to all people. So we don't fund in every single, in every single area. We're funding with a results orientation. And right now, in the area that we're in, 20 years ago it was different. Probably 10 years from now it may be different. Right now we're really heavily focused around challenges that relate to climate change, that relate to agriculture and agricultural productivity. We, we focus on challenges that relate to energy and energy poverty. What didn't come up, but all of us know that it's a real, a real issue in terms of power and power generation on the African continent. And then youth unemployment, as someone mentioned, just the fact that the youngest continent on the, on, on the planet. So the areas of agriculture, the areas of energy, the areas of youth employment and youth, youth entrepreneurship, that's where we're spending a lot of our funding now. And the solutions that we're supporting are, are locally grown and generated in, in Africa. So I want to break down this sort of some of the things that we're doing in those, in those areas. So agriculture. So agriculture is really interesting. And I want to sort of go with the, the climate change theme because it's also a reality. So let me tell you about a story. As was mentioned, I spent the past six years before a year and a half ago um, coming back to D.C. in Nairobi, Kenya, but traveled all over the continent. But in, in Kenya, I made a, a smallholder farmer named Nancy. Seventy percent of all Africans derive their livelihoods from the agricultural value chain. Seventy plus percent. Seventy plus percent of the people who are in agriculture are also women. And so Nancy is, is Nancy from from central Kenya, but she's representative of, two, of 250 million smallholder farmers um, throughout, throughout the continent. So Nancy's, Nancy didn't go to Oxford or Said, and she didn't study strategy and, and innovation. Her strategy and innovation is two words. It's called hope and prayer. Why is that her strategy? Because that's all she really has. Nancy's reality as a smallholder farmer in, in East Africa or somewhat in Africa writ large, is based upon hope and prayer. Why is that? Because Nancy has some seeds that she got from her neighbor. Maybe she bought them, but more likely than not, she got them from, from, from her neighbor. And she has to hope and pray that those seeds are good seeds. Then she has to hope and pray when she puts those seeds in the ground that the soil is fertile enough for those seeds to germinate hope and prayer. She has to maybe do a dance and hope and pray that what? That it rains. Only 4% of African agriculture is under irrigation. Climate change is real. The rainy season is no longer the rainy season. Your parents, a lot of you here, your parents will tell you, will tell you that. The expectations that you've had before of when it was going to be hot, when it was going to be cold, when it was going to be raining, when it was going to be harvest, all changing. So Nancy is still hoping and praying that the seeds germinate, that they're real, that the rains are going to come. She hopes that the rains come and her, her yield um, brings forth good bounty, but she's also hoping and praying it's not um, basically eaten by pest and disease. Because she didn't have that much fertilizer, she definitely didn't have any, any pesticides to stop any pest and disease from destroying all the good fortune that she's had from the germination from the soil, from the rains. She's still hoping and praying. <clears throat> She's successful. There is a harvest. 
Now she's hoping and praying that she finds a market fast. Fast is key. Why? Because Nancy doesn't have storage. There's no place. It was, it's called a good year problem. You have a good year in African agriculture, but it becomes a problem because you don't have a place to store the actual bounty that came. So now when it's raining and your crops are in the field or they're in your yard or, or area, the rains come down again, the, the mice, the weevils, all, all those same things. So she needs storage or she needs to sell that product really fast. <clears throat> so she's praying she gets a market. Then she's hoping and praying that she gets a fair price because she has to make enough from that harvest to feed herself, feed her family, and enough to hopefully buy some more seeds and do it all again the next season. That's the reality of African agriculture for the vast majority of people, 70 plus percent in that ag value chain. It's not strategy, it's not innovation, it's hope and prayer. <clears throat> some real predictability, some real technology, some real data, some real information around what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, um, and to authenticate whether it's the seeds or, or other things. And so we support and fund a number of things related to technology and African agriculture because there are solutions out there. They're just not being scaled and they're not you know, widespread, but we are trying to use innovation and technology in the ag space to, to help Nancy and, and farmers like her to be able to do more with what they have. So we're using, you know, digitizing information as assets to estimate the right size of yields. In Rwanda, anybody here from Rwanda? In Rwanda, um, we support Inyazi maize farmers. A cooperative has 2,000 smallholders who need to have precise information about the plots of land that they depend on for their livelihoods and their lives. But in a country like Rwanda, called the land of, anybody? A thousand hills. It's the most densely populated country on the continent. And it's there's a thousand hills. <laughs> so in a place like Rwanda, agriculture is tough in general and because of the dense population. And so it can be really, really hard in having this level of, of plot mapping. What is their actual land? Again, going back to Nancy. Nancy can tell you her what her land is, but if she tried to go to a bank to get somebody to finance that land, whether or not she owns it or not, they want to know, well, how much land is it? You know what Nancy has to say? Well, my land starts over there with that tree, and then it, over there, that big rock, that's where my, my land ends, and over here where there's this bush, and that's my, my plot. Is that one acre, two acres, five hectares? What, what is it? How does Nancy know? So plot mapping is a real, real innovation to know what actual land is under cultivation. And so we're working with smallholders to help them map their plots. We're actually in Rwanda and Tanzania using drone technology, supporting African innovators who are using drone technology, geo geospatial data, to map farmers' plots. So just like I can come in and say, where is the school of government and where is my hotel? And I can see all that GPS mapping. Farmers having the ability to plot, to plot their land using GPS technology to determine then the right amounts of fertilizer to buy and to use. Because before that, it was just a guessing game for most farmers to know exactly how much land they had under production, but also how they were going to make, make those decisions. Our grant financing, the maximum level is the startup capital is $250,000 which sounds like a lot, and it could be in some instances, but it's, 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 we right-size it so there could be $100,000 grants. It just really depends on what the community group needs. But now, you know, think of those maize farmers in, in Rwanda. They're investing, you know, with, the, with this $250,000 grant, they get to build now a milling factory that they know what the throughput will really be because they have access to information and technology around how much is it growing, how much is going to come through. And then when they ask, when they ask for a grant for a milling facility, we know it's not going to just sit there and be dormant, that it will be used because there's some real data on how much throughput can come in. So data is really, really important, and data can be you know, generated through technologies, and then farmers can make better informed predictions on their crop yields and revenues, and they're using that data to negotiate better financing options from banks to purchase their inputs ahead of time during the growing season, and they're using that data to reach out to buyers in advance 
of the harvest to expand their markets and increase their sales because they now have some predictability. Nancy knows how much she's going to actually have and she can find markets ahead of time. So that's just one example of, of how the power of innovation and technology in the agriculture space is really, really transforming people's lives and we're funding you know, hundreds of cooperatives throughout the continent to think about because a lot of you grew up with your parents one way or another involved in agriculture, but what's the cooperative of the future? The cooperative of the future has a digital registry. All those farmers, 2000, know what their plot sizes are. As an aggregated unit, they can go to a bank and say, this is how much we have under cultivation. It's not the registries and the books that look like this with all the names, and so-and-so passed away three years ago, but their name's still on the registry. Digitizing this data is really important because it becomes money becomes information. That's what banks and insurance providers and input providers are paying for, that real knowledge. And so if Nancy and thousands and thousands of smallholders have this level of innovation and technology that Africans are coming up with and we can help catalyze and support, it's going to be transformational. And it is, it is, it is helping. It's helping thousands and thousands of, of Nancys. So agriculture, food security, linked to climate change, real challenge, something that we are using our seed capital, our technical assistance to, to work on. <clears throat> Let's move to power. Power is, is an area that, I lived in Nigeria. I lived in Nigeria for, for three years, and it's just a place where the amount of African ingenuity and entrepreneurship and everything is there, and then the lights go out and then, you're, and then <laughs> you, you, you things stop, and then they come back on, and then they stop. And it's really, really challenging to have real, a real business environment in a place like that. But the, the, his, the hidden thing around energy and power in Africa is that the people who don't have power actually pay more to access power. The poor or without pay more to access power. Why? Because they, don't have, they may not have electricity connected to the grid, where they're paying, like I do in Washington, D.C., I have a monthly electricity bill, right? They have a daily bill, daily, because they're buying candles. They're buying kerosene. They're buying diesel. They're buying batteries every single day to have access to power. So the amount of money that's there, if we think about the ratios of my monthly bill and their daily bill, much more the poor are paying for power. A continent of a billion people, 600 million without power. Some countries, a 2% connectivity level, 2% of an entire nation without access to energy. So energy poverty is real. It's not something that we talk about in, in the same way we talk about food security and, and poverty from, from a, uh, a food security standpoint, but energy poverty is, is real and it's stifling. It's stifling innovation, it's stifling growth in so many ways. And so what we've said to ourselves and what communities are asking us for is more access to energy from renewable sources. And the beauty of this is that those of us who live in the UK or the US or anywhere in Europe, when we think about renewable energy sources, it's hip, it's cool. Right? It's like it's the hot thing, wind, the sun, water, and we have to convert from fossil fuels and from other things. It's a conversion. And, ah, you know, the price points, an electric car, I'm not really sure, all of these things. In Africa, it's the starting, the starting point. Renewable, clean, green is the starting point. So the level of innovation that's happening throughout the continent makes what's happening with Elon Musk and, and in Silicon Valley look silly. If you really looked at the aggregate, because people are doing this out of necessity. They are innovating and constantly coming up with solutions to give them access to power that's more cost effective. And so the African energy challenge is real, and it's going to be solved by those that are facing the challenge every, every single day. So energy is an area that we, we invest in, and we, we invest in African energy entrepreneurs. We have something called the Off-Grid Energy Challenge, where we, throughout the continent, we have a challenge fund where we're saying $100,000 invested in 100% African-owned and operated renewable energy solution providers, and this is in solar and wind and water different areas. And so one example is a young guy, Ifayan Orojaka, in Nigeria, $100,000 grant. He 
um, created a, a mini grid, him and two of his, his buddies, a mini grid um, household solar solution um, connected 200 households after one year, was able to scale, then went to the Bank of Industry in Ni Nigeria. Those of you who are Nigeria know the Bank of Industry got a $1.3 million loan below market rates, and now they're transforming communities and have over 3,000 households now that are connected, and it's a, it's a, you know, a profit-generating model. That's a startup capital of $100,000 that's now, that's 10x, a 10x return that he really has a real business in there. We have 70 plus investments like this throughout, throughout the continent. So investing in, in innovation in the, in the energy space to solve the challenge of energy poverty is something that's really important to us. And let me close on, on youth, because <clears throat> it's something that has talked about. Madam First Lady mentioned it in, in the questioning. I mean, Africa, Africa is now, Africa is the future. It's the here and now, and it's the future. The average age of somebody in the UK, anybody know? UK citizen, average age? 40. It's actually right, 100%. 40. In the US, 37 years old. In Africa, the continent wide, about 17. In countries like Niger, countries like Uganda, 15. Average age. So you're talking about a young, young population. Every month, 10 million, no, every month or every year, 10 million people coming into the job market. The job market in Africa sustains about 3 million people. 3 million young people coming in. So we have to create jobs. So it's about employment and it's also about entrepreneurship and it's about funding and supporting African entrepreneurship in a very, very um, direct way. And so with a number of initiatives in the U.S. government and in that with African governments, the AU was mentioned, we've been able to really spur the catalyzing of African innovations. And that's one of the draws that brought us here even to Oxford because a lot of you sitting in, in the audience and as, as Dion mentioned, the six finalists are coming up with solutions that are solving social challenges but are also providing economic opportunity. So that double bottom line is really important. Social entrepreneurship where it's a social societal challenge but it also has a financially viable uh, business model is the solution to really having win-win solutions, and we're funding in a lot of those th a lot of those spaces. And some of them are in the agriculture and energy nexus: solar-powered irrigation, solar-powered milling, cold storage. So a number of things are again disruptive because they're integrating and connecting different challenges to meet bigger, bigger needs. And so, with with what you're doing here at Oxford, it's one of the reasons why we came and said, how do we um, use our interest and some of our capital, but also back some of your ideas. Literally back those ideas and make sure that when you're going home, those of you who choose to go back home, that you have a partner in the African Development Foundation that really can help you do what you need to do, what you want to do for your community, but how can we be a part of sort of helping you on that journey? And so we were proud and are proud to, to um, fund the, the Africa, I mean, the innovation fair, and are really excited about the solutions that, that are coming that are coming up. I mean, you're talking about people that are taking um, solutions for waste. One man's waste is another man's treasure. That's a real, real thing. Somebody's doing air to water. You know, people are looking at ed tech and skill, um, skills gap technology. So all of these things, this is not, you know, something that has to happen in one region of the world, whether it's Silicon Valley or happens, has to happen somewhere in a regional world in, in Israel. It's happening all over the continent, but it's also Africans who are outside of the continent coming up with solutions and then going back. And so that's one of the reasons why we were really proud to be here be here, me as an individual, to meet and greet with all of you, but also to back some of the innovations and solutions that are, that are going to be transforming Africa, again, not only today, but for years, years to come. So excited about innovation, excited about Africa, and excited about being here. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Glynn. Um, and we'll move right into the innovation fair because we're running out of time. I just want to start by introducing our two, uh, two other judges. We have three judges for the fair today. Um, first is C.D. Glynn, who you just heard uh, speak to us. Second judge is Tatenda Yamuda. Tatenda is currently a candidate for an MBA at Said Business School, University of Oxford. 
Tatenda has over eight years' experience in finance and impact investing roles working in Africa, the UK, and the US. To date, she has advised clients on how and where to in invest their impact capital in emerging markets by designing and structuring new innovative financing mechanisms. Tatenda has worked on designing and structuring a range of impact bond financing mechanisms in the healthcare sector, specifically cataracts in Cameroon, malaria in Mo Mozambique, and most recently, early childhood development in South Africa. She conducted a design and, and needs assessment of an impact investing platform targeted at micro fran franchises and micro enterprises operating in Johannesburg for the municipal government, leading to an implementation go no go decision. She also de designed and the she designed the strategy and created the operation specifications for a blended finance investor marketplace convergence, the first of its kind targeting at accelerating blended finance in transactions in emerging markets. Tatenda is a registered chartered accountant with the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants. Tatenda holds a Bachelor of, ba of Business Science degree in finance and accounting as well as a postgraduate diploma in accounting from the University of Cape Town. Our second judge, Owen Henkel, is a DPhil student with the Department of Education here at the University of Oxford. Owen has 10 years of professional experience in education, edtech, data analysis, and impact investing. Leveraging his background in program evaluation and strategy consulting, he helps companies solve some of their most difficult problems, improve their performance, and expand their impact. He has worked with ed education organizations in over 15 countries and is professionally fluent in Spanish. He is currently Director of Efficacy and Research at Pearson Affordable Learning Fund, where he works across the portfolio to measure, report, and improve student learning outcomes. He also serves on the board of Spark Schools, Avanti Learning Centers, Karate Path, and the Global Schools Forum. Previously, Owen worked at McKinsey & Co. as a mentor to edtech startups in Latin America and as Teach for America Corps member in post-Katrina New Orleans. Owen holds a dual MBA MA at the University of Michigan where he focused on statistics, education technology, and impact investing. As I said before, he is currently completing a PhD at the University of Oxford, focusing on artificial intelligence in education. A round of applause for our judges, please. So right now, we'd like to start with our first um, innovator. We have five in total. Three couldn't make it here because of visa and time constraints. But we're, what's more important is telling their stories and showing their work. So we'll show their work through videos. And we have two other innovators who are, who are physically present to pitch their ideas. And so for the videos, we have their accompanying um, slides, which will be given to the judges after the fair for deliberations. Thank you. Hello, I'm Charlotte Ainebiona Kigezo, the founder of Biona Help Group. Now, Biona Help Group is made up of two people, and that's I, the founder, and the co-founder, Sunday Salome. Biona Help Group is completely based on the fact that we are trying to build a place and a space in which the youth are able to deal with their psychological issues while they can relate on a more personal level and definitely get professional help, but at the same time, get mentorship and career guidance. We aim at seeing that as a company, we are able to help the youth deal with major psychological issues and mental problems that drag them down each day. Beyond a Help Group's goal is to see that 
First, the young people appreciate counseling as a whole and definitely grow in the counseling system in which they're able to get mentorship, career guidance and relations from a counselor to a counselor. Viona Help Group has been functioning since June 2017. Viona Help Group is now nine months old. As an organization, one of our challenges is that we live in a place where counseling has not yet been appreciated. And for that fact, half of our time has been taken up trying to do awareness in the society of how counseling should be taken up. One of our major goals in the next financial year is to see that each secondary school does accommodate a counselor in which counselors are taken up to do the counseling activities for each school and help people between the ages of 13 to 26 deal with common psychological problems. These include depression and anxiety. Research has been done that the highest level of suicide in the country or in the world has been between the ages of 13 to 26. Now you know our target group. Our target group is the young people, 13 to 26, but we've divided them into two groups, 13 to 19 and 20 to 26. Viona Help Group's budget currently is at 10 million, which is our starting budget to be able to register our company. Viona Help Group's annual budget will be 18 million because each year we will have annual quarterly awareness events in which young people will be trained on what they are to do with their common knowledge. Now, Viona Help Group has fully been based on the fact that we need to see a society that is mentally stable, mentally healthy, and definitely helping the youth deal with their common flesh-related temptations. I hope this has been a pitch enough to let you know of what Viona Help Group is made all about. Thank you. So that was Charlotte from Uganda, um, who's a trained social psychologist. Next up, we have EcoAct Tanzania. So that's um, Christian, who is here now, um, and he'll give us his pitch in fifteen in five minutes. Sorry. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christian Mujage from Tanzania. My core business is transforming garbage into timber. So before I start, I'll tell you a very short story about my friend Michael. Six years back, I had a friend of mine called Michael. Michael was doing a border border activity, like just transforming, transporting people from one place to another place. Very unfortunately, one day my friend Michael got an accident, very bad one. He was sent to the hospital. He was supposed to undergo surgery, but it was very expensive for him to cover the medication bills. So we had to contribute. At the time we were contributing, it was too late for my friend Michael. Then my friend Michael died. So what I learned from the incident is Michael died because he could not have enough money to pay for the medical expenses, or he could not have enough money to pay for the medical bills, and he didn't have medical health insurance. But when I read from the scenario, Michael is, was living in the slum areas, like you know many of some of our African fellows. And in my country, Tanzania, more than 3.5 people live on the slum. These are poor people who are earning less than $2 per day. 94% of them, they don't have medical health insurance because they cannot afford it. The only thing poor people have for free is garbage. So you could see from that incident, Normally when it rains at that, all this plastic garbage go to the water stream, they end up in the ocean, causing more than 9 million tons of plastic every year. These are going to the oceans and harming the oceans. You saw plastics, I saw an opportunity. Then we came in, we spoke to the slum guys, we launched what we call garbage magical insurance, telling the slum guys to give us 30 kilograms of plastic garbage every month, and then for that, we offer them medical insurance coverage for one year for, per family. Because in my country, you have to pay to dispose your garbage. Poor people don't have money to spend on that. So they wake up in the night and throw them in the streets, polluting the environment. So we got a lot of plastics. Then me and my team, we developed a technology of transforming plastic garbage into durable, strong, long-lasting plastic timber. 
This, is, this plus team are used for building and construction. For the first time, we have developed a chemical-free and energy-conservative technology from bees, bees that's coming from Waxi. We are patenting that. So when we, we get these plastic timbers, we sell to the, mostly to the ESF developers, who are our main clients. And the money we get from selling this plastic timber, we cover the medical bills and uh, medical insurance for the slum folks and the remaining 30% for the profit for the company. We are developing a very unique product which are recyclable, longer lasting, so that they are, we differentiate ourselves from, from timber, which is our main competitor. This is the team behind this innovation. Everybody bringing his expertise on our social enterprise and some of the awards we have won from this innovation. Look on the market side. We're really focusing on the timber market, which is a very huge market, but we are focusing building a product that will satisfy the building furniture segment. And we are hoping to capture 15% of the African market share by 2020. But be, us being a social enterprise, we are developing our, uh, our business, trying to focus on till bottom line to save the environment, save the people, and generate revenue. So for the first time, we began this last year, we managed to withdraw more than one million tons of plastic garbage from the environment. And gave, for the first year, 475 people from the slums medical health coverage for one year. And this is what we are, still, we are targeting by 2020, to withdraw at least 10 million kilograms of garbage from the environment. Some of the products that we produce using plastic timber include fencing, this products we have in, uh, sold in Tanzania and Burundi, garden furnitures using plastic timber, floor decking, house gates, some of them. We are definitely recycling, because this, this, this picture speaks a lot to me. Because in my country, when you are sick, you have to go to hospital and pay to see a normal doctor to get treated. Sometimes when you, are, you have some complication, you have to see someone who is really specialized. It's very expensive for the poor people in my, in my country to, to, to pay for that. Nobody access that. You simply stay like that or die like that. Because to see the experts or the, speci the, the specialists is very expensive. But for the first time, when we launched Garbage Medical Insurance, Mamazena was one of our clients who, who provides medical uh, garbage. He was able to meet the specialist with a stomach problem for the first time. So this is why we say we are recycling to put smile into the environment, into the lives of people. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Very inspiring. Next, we have another video by Eitayo from Nigeria, whose um, company, Utiva, is an edtech company hoping to bridge the skills gap in Nigeria. Can we have the lights? I am speaking all the way from Lagos, Nigeria. I am a social entrepreneur and I run an organization that is called Utiva. Utiva is a social enterprise that is structured as an education technology company that helps young people in universities and also in polytechnics to acquire skills and competences for the job market. What we do is to help young people transition from school to job by helping them acquire the necessary skills that they need to have to get job opportunities. So, we are democratizing skills, competences, and access to job. And we're not just doing that, we are also helping fast rising companies and startups in this part of the world to assess talent. If you ask the 33 million MSMEs that we have in this part of the world, they all have the same narrative. To find talent is difficult. So what we do is to develop young people while they are in school so that they can transition to jobs and also help fast rising companies to assess these talents. Let me tell you the reality of my organization. At the moment we are working with students across 25 universities and that is about 12,000 students. But the truth is there is a fundamental problem that we are trying to solve and the problem is that 
96% of educational institutions in this part of the world claim that they are preparing young people for jobs. But only 9% of business leaders say that people are actually prepared for the job market. We are asked about 91% of these business leaders say that no, young people don't have skills for the job market. So we are solving three major problems. Skill gap, which is also the competence gap, access to talent, and our deficient pedagogy and learning approach for training young people in this part of the world. To be truthful, there are about 25 million young persons in my country that are unemployed and underemployed. And the problem is not that there are no jobs. The problem is they don't have skills for the job market. They are not prepared for the job market. So we are a combination of two different things. Physical training and online learning. So we use technology to reinforce and to augment learning. I haven't done physical training in classes for students. So Utiva is an education technology company. We are helping young people bridge skill gap. We have a faculty of 70 people across the country among intrapreneurs, entrepreneurs, academia that help us to translate the need of employers into curriculum. And this curriculum is delivered through three different methods. One, physical training. So we organize boot camps in all the universities. It, actually, we have boot camps organized in 25 universities. We have an online learning platform that help young people to access you know, content. They give them access to learning materials and also help them to evaluate or to validate their skill, how they are closing the skill gap. And we also have Jutiva communities in all the universities where we are working. So we are a combination of two different things, physical learning and online learning. Now let me quickly say this, as Nigeria emerges, as Nigeria becomes better, as Sub-Saharan Africa becomes better in terms of access to data and technology, we will reduce our efforts on physical learning and improve our effort on online learning. Now let me walk you through a few of the things that we've done. But before I talk about that, let me talk about how big is this market. Currently, an average university in Nigeria has about 20,000 students. So if you do the maths, 20,000 times 300 universities, that's a whole lot. But at the moment, in the 25 universities where we are working, we only have access to less than 1% of the students. So there is more to do. There is more to do and there are more students to have access to. And let's talk about the demand side of the business. The organizations that we're helping to get access to these young talents. Currently in this part of the world, there are 33 million MSMs, but we only have 2,000 companies that we are working with. So there is more to do and there are more organizations to help solve problems. But let me walk you through what we've been able to do over the years. Between the time that we started to now, we have only gained access to 25 universities and there are 300 universities in Nigeria. Right now, we've only helped about 9,200 students to get our learning opportunities. But we've only helped about 719 of them in 2017 to gain access to jobs. So there is more to do, there is more opportunity, and there is more knowledge to close. Let me walk you through my team. I am the co-founder and I am the chief executive officer of the team. And my background is in consulting. I worked in the US and Nigeria and five other countries managing projects. But my partner, who is the academic director, also worked in the US for two years, majorly developing curriculums and developing training to help college students close bridge gap. His name is Gamola Johnson. Then the program manager, Benga Ojibanere, currently is a lecturer in the university and is also part of the team. We have one other person on our team who is a creative, who is a training coordinator. Her name is Tobiwa, and I'm most excited about her because she helps us to ensure that trainings going on all the universities are functional. Then Osara. Osara is the operations lead. Then also Winifred. Winifred currently is running an MBA in one of the Ivy League universities in the US and she's a practice lead of the organization. We have a robust team, highly dedicated to solve this problem, and we are sold into the social mission. Thank you so much. My name is Yutiba. And as we always say in Yutiba, talent is common, 
one of the cheerleaders and not. Thank you. Thank you, Eitayu. I'm actually with him on WhatsApp. We, I was just telling him how his pitch was going. Um, <laughs> next, we have Zako. It's also another video, um, so you can keep the lights down. Um, and this is a renewable energy company that turns coconut waste into charcoal. So we'll be hearing from Amin, Amin Sule. Hi, I'm Sule Amin Abubakar, and I'm here to present to you Zako. Zako is a renewable, affordable, and clean energy we are producing from waste. Ghana is blessed with a lot of resources and a lot of waste. So our product here is to make very good use of waste in the city. Zako is a measure of two words. One. We'll just move on to our next pitch, um, which is magic water. Anastasia is here, um, and then we'll try and fix our call before. Um, <laughs> so, here you go. Okay, to the next to go There is six times more water in the atmosphere than there is in all of the rivers in the world combined. Some people call it the world's sixth ocean. But there are some places in our world also that have very little water on the ground or anywhere. One of those places is Kenya. My co-founder Beth Koigi is Kenyan, and she grew up in the you know, statistics that are on the screen right now where one in two Kenyans lack access to clean drinking water across all socioeconomic levels that they may find themselves in. And that ultimately leads to missed school sometimes, missed employment, and 10,000 deaths per year related to waterborne illness. And Beth has been in this space for a while. She started a successful, successful water filtration company and ran it for five years. But she realized that even some of the most sophisticated water filtration technology available didn't work when there wasn't any water to filter. Anyone here from Kenya remembers the drought the last couple of years where even people in the heart of Nairobi sometimes didn't have water in the piped infrastructure. So we looked into another source, the atmosphere. But what's available in atmospheric water generation doesn't work in Kenya. It requires high humidity, it's expensive, and it requires a lot of energy. So really, the technology that's out there, it didn't work for us. So we built a proof of concept that was powered by the sun. It produced 10 liters of water a day. And most importantly, it used desiccants. What are desiccants? They are water-loving materials that absorb water from the air. And when you heat them, they release that water. So if you ever bought a, a pair of new sneakers or a bag, and you have that little pack of clear balls, that's a type of desiccant, that's silica gel. They're non-toxic, they're abundant, and they're cheaply available. So we are a hardware startup, so we're deep in the iteration phase of our prototype. So this was a little speck of our iteration of last year. We started in September. We quickly moved into this one a couple months ago, uh, so you can see the design. It looks a bit like a barbecue. <laughs> And, uh, oh, there's, we had, anyway, we had a picture of uh, our team with our new, our actual physical version of this last week in Nairobi. Um, you can come up to me after, I'd, I'd love to show you. We're very proud. <laughs> um, so how do we compare with what's available? Five cents per liter was how much we produced water with our proof of concept. That was the first device you saw there. It was already cheaper than some of the options available, like 
premium bottled water, which you know is clean. Our goal is to get to one cent per liter, which would make us the most affordable source of clean drinking water in our market. And of course, clean drinking water isn't a Kenyan issue. The UN predicts that in the next eight years, almost two billion people will have an issue with water scarcity, which means no easy access to clean drinking water. So we are a very diverse team. We come from three different continents, as well as our backgrounds. So Claire Sewell is a, a fellow Oxford alumni, and she studied here uh, finance, and she's our finance and strategy expert. Beth Koigi has our deep market expertise, and she's our CEO. And myself, I am an environmental scientist, and I worked in uh, water tech product R&D in the past. So we visited many places in Kenya to understand how do people access water? What are the various technologies people already use? We visited places like Makueni and Nakuru. We visited places that are very dry and places that actually have too much rain. And we developed our two customer segments out of that user research. So what we're optimizing for is a censored enabled technology, as we heard about data, data, data is important, and a pay-as-you-go model to make sure there's no prohibitively high upfront costs to use this technology. So these are our segments. We have our rural low income segment, which is the impact side of our social enterprise uh, startup. And that is providing water at under one cent per liter in a pay, pay per liter system. As uh, anyone who has been to Kenya knows, mobile money there is ubiquitous. So we are integrating with M-Pesa, which is what people use to buy things anyway, which is using your cell phone to buy things. Our second segment is what sustains us as a for-profit business, which is selling to peri-urban, middle-income people who will buy branded bottled water from either a kiosk or franchise system at 12 to 15 cents per liter. It's still cheaper than what the bottled water is there now on average. So where we're at now, um, we are again very early and every cent we've won in prizes and grants has been put into our hardware prototype. So we hope that with your support that we'll be able to launch our pilot in the next six months so we can test this with people and have them actually taste the water. We want to make sure that it's palatable. So we are Magic Water. Magi is a Swahili word for water and the K is for Kuvuna, which stands for harvest. So at Magic Water, we want to create the opportunity for people to have air and then have clean drinking water. Thank you very much. So the Zako mystery has been solved. Um, oh, oops, okay. Nope. So I'll go back. Or, okay, you do your thing. Hi, I'm Sule Amin Abubakar, and I'm here to present to you Zako. Zako is a renewable, affordable, and clean energy we are producing from waste. 
Ghana is blessed with a lot of resources and a lot of waste. So our product here is to make very good use of waste in the city. Zako is a measure of two words. One house word meaning hot, that's Zafi, and the other word that is charcoal. So we merge these two words together to get Zako. And what Zako is about is to convert all these waste into clean, affordable energy. The World Health Organization estimates that over 16,600 people die annually in Ghana alone from cooking smoke inhalation. And over 75% of Ghanaians use charcoal as their main source of cooking fuel. Our charcoal actually lasts longer than ordinary charcoal, so it's cost efficient and it has a higher energy content. So you have the best of energy you need. Our charcoal is smokeless, renewable energy that is going to save lives, save the environment, and create jobs for people. And since we are not cutting down trees to manufacture Zarco, we are reducing Ghana's carbon footprint. So support our movement. Let's make Zaku a reality. Thank you. So um, those were our five innovators for this year's innovation fair. I hope you were all inspired and um, motivated. I hope it triggered some new ideas in your minds as well. And I hope that it's encouraging to you as well to support um, local businesses, local innovators on the continent. Um, and so with that, we'd like to thank our judges once again. We'll be moving to another room to go and continue our deliberations. But um, we'd like to say a big thank you and um, a big thank you to all of you as well for sitting through our, our fair and our pitches. Thank you. So I'll invite um, our co-chair, Nokolo, to um, come and give the closing remarks. Thank you. I'll try to be brief as possible. Uh, we have now concluded the program for the first day of the conference, and I hope that it has left many of you excited for what is to come tomorrow. A couple of thanks to, a couple, uh, to people who this day, as well as tomorrow, would not have been possible to begin the First Lady for honoring our invitation to be our keynote speaker to open the conference, as well as her team, the Blavatnik School of Government, for hosting us today and tomorrow, Mr. C.D. Glenn, as well as our Innovation Fair judges, Tatenda and Owen, as well as the Innovation Fair innovators who have applied and taken the time to actually present their work at the Oxford Africa Conference, as well as Turkish Airlines, who has sponsored the majority of our speakers for this conference. And on that note, I'd like to say we look forward to welcoming you all at tonight's gala dinner and up and early tomorrow for the full day of the conference program. And just a slight announcement, if there are any delegates in the room who have bought a gala dinner ticket but are not planning to attend the gala dinner, please do approach my colleagues at the back, Edna, just raise your hand, as well as Abdul on this side for... Um, that and on that note, thank you so much for coming. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>